Hello, my name is Margaret Huang. I'm a senior scientist at Nanostream Technology. And today I'll be talking to you about technical features of the genomic high-flex RNA assay with the sequencing readout that my team has developed. First, a quick outline of my talk. In the first half, I'll provide a brief review of genomic technology, and I'd like to point out three features in particular. In the second half, I'll review NGS readout and discuss some technical data. So genomics and DSB is a novel highly multiplex assay that digitally characterizes RNA and protein expression from spatially discrete regions of interest within tissue sections. Here's a high-level overview of our workflow. On the left, it starts with a high-flex mixture of in situ probes for RNA or antibodies for protein. The probe head is the analyte-specific region, and the probe tail is the, the, the detection region. Between the head and tail is the UV photocleavable spacer. After processing the slides and loading our DSP instrument in the middle here, uh, 20X scans are generated to image the tissue section. ROIs are selected and ultraviolet light illuminated to photo release the detection tails of the probes. Probes are collected and quantitated either by direct hybridization with nanostream and counter technology, or in what I'll be covering today, by sequencing using the Illumina platform. The result is a rich data set of expression profiling region by region. So the first feature I'd like to highlight is genomics multi-analyte capabilities. To do this, two serial sections are processed. The RNA layer will undergo an in situ hybridization protocol, while the protein layer undergoes an aminohistochemistry protocol. The genomics instrument will image these serial sections, and the user can co-register the images to select overlapping ROIs. This results in high-flex multi-analyte RNA plus protein analysis of the tissue sample. The second feature that I'd like to highlight is at the heart of our genomics technology. It is the ability to shape ultraviolet light onto the tissue. Essentially, it's microdissection by light. This is done with a digital mirror device that contains a million mirrors of about one micron width and height, such that 100 mirrors are used to illuminate one small T cell. Shown here in the middle is an illumination pattern based on the morphology of the tissue. The tumor region is stained with the visualization marker and cytoperitin, pseudocolored in gold here. And a tumor mask is created to profile the tumor region only. And then the inverse of this mask is created to profile the microenvironment. This leads to five unique ROI profiling modalities, an expansive set of user-defined tools depending on application and experimental design. These include geometric profiling, segment profiling, contouring from a, a fixed distance, a gridded pattern um, for unbiased assessment of your tissue, and rare, rare cell profiling, for example, um, selecting all the tumor um, infiltrating lymphocytes. The last feature I'd like to highlight is specific to detection and quantification of the photo release oligos by NGS readout and what my team is developing. Multiple probes targeting the same transcript are molecularly barcoded and quantitated such that there are up to 10 independent counts per transcript. This leads to very robust quantitation where during the analysis there were outlier probes in a target set, possibly due to absence or off-target effects. They are readily identified and maybe filtered out. Target counts are averaged, which minimizes inherent probe-specific effects such as sequence composition and hybridization efficiencies. Additionally, because multiple probes can scan the transcript, this also has potential to detect splice variants, which I'll touch on in the next section, too. This leads to my second half of my talk, um, Geomic DSB High-Flex RNA assay with NGS readout. So we developed the high-flex RNA panel that targets key pathways in the tumor microenvironment, and immune response. Specifically, we combined the content from three of our best-selling can-cancer and counter-assays, pathways, 
immune profiling in IO360. Within this panel, we have negative in situ probes that measure nonspecific binding, which defines our level of detection, and a robust housekeeper panel of 12 genes to normalize for differences in cell number within different sizes and shapes of regions of interest. The table shows a number of concept panels we developed leading up to our commercial set of 1,600, more than 1,600 targets. Here's the overview of the NGS workflow, starting with the library prep, then the sequencing, and then the data processing. One thing I'd like to note is that I won't cover today is that we have enabled our sequencing workflow for protein also. Um, and the library prep is shown on the left here. For the high flex RNA assay, uh, we have the library prep involves uh, PCR and amplification with indexing using unique dual indices, which I'll cover in design in the second slide. After library prep, ROIs are multiplexed on Illumina instrument, um, and the read depth depends on experimental conditions, uh, tissue type, sample quality, ROI size and number of ROIs multiplex. But in general, typical sequencing read depth could fit, for example, 96 ROIs with a standard workflow on a next seek. After on-instrument demultiplexing with the Luna unique uh, dual index workflows, uh, we, we process the data through a bioinformatic pipeline, which is pretty straightforward, um, involves trimming the sequences, aligning them, um, remo removing PCR duplicates with our unique molecular identifiers, EMI, and creating a digital count. I'd like to highlight some design features of our um, high-flex RNA assay in particular. On the right side, you'll see the photo-release oligo that comes off of the tissue that um, will be sequenced. Uh, there's a UMI embedded in there, uh, and that is designed to be at uh, adjacent to read one, um, which ensures high, high complexity during the image analysis and base polling algorithms during the sequencing. The barcode is a 12 nucleotide barcode that identifies the analyte, and those codes have been um, op bioinformatically optimized to prevent barcode collision with um, at least three mismatches between different barcodes. The UMI itself is a 14 mar, uh, which is a large molecular space to accommodate many different types of experimental design and prevents underestimation of molecule counts. And lastly, as I mentioned, there are unique dual indices, um, and those are um, bioinformatically created to have a handling distance of two between the two, between different indices, and our color balance on the two color and four color platforms. And all these design features of our Luna uh, detection tag um, create a high quality sequencing either on any platform of Luna. Next, I'd like to go through some of the technical performance data um, that we had on some of our development panels. On the left, you can see the reproducibility of serial sections. These sections were five micron FSP sections of uh, di 23 different cell lines. And there are 14, 12 gene targets here, um, making up 5,000 different probes. High reproducibility. In the middle, you'll see that um, one thing that we see often is the scalability of the multiplexing. And what, what is shown here is uh, an experiment on the x-axis where there's a 96 gene panel comprised of 928 different probes. And comparing that overlapping number of probes into a higher flex. Um, the 1412 gene panel, which is about 5,000 probes. And what you can see is a nice correlation of counts between the two. 
And what that suggests is that the probes are acting independently of each other, regardless of the plex size. Lastly, on the right is concordance um, with an orthogonal method. So on the x-axis is uh, the same channel, 96 gene channel, um, using our encounter direct hybridization readout and comparing counts from that to our NGS readout of that same 96 gene panel. And what you see is a nice correlation um, which validates the count but also suggests that the library prep in itself is not skewing the count. Here are some more technical data, and uh, what I'd like to go through is some of the raw data that comes off of, um, of these experiments. And so on the left is our control uh, FFP section with 23 different cell lines um, that are spotted in this array. And we use these control cell lines as validation. Um, it has a number of orthogonal data types such as the N-counter assay or RNA-seq um, sequencing. So we validate our count, our NGS counts with that. Uh, we also use these to validate our probes. What's shown are four of the graphs, the raw data graphs um, from this experiment. First graph on the upper left is the negative control, so it's the glass surface, just drawing an ROI on this glass surface. And the other three are tissues. And what you'll see is sort of um, in this 96 gene panel are that the probes sort of group together and jump up above background. And the background is defined by uh, some ERCC negative probes that are just scrambled sequences highlighted in yellow on the right side of each graph. And you can see that there's a sort of this baseline of ne negative um, non-specific findings that we define as our level de of detection. And so I'd like to show this graph to people just to show you could see the background with an, um, and engage that with the ERCC and then you see the signal which are the 10 probes that jump above that background. And that's pretty much the raw data and how that looks. In the next slide, uh, it's the same experiment, but graphed in a, in a different way um, to show the 10 different tiles for each sample. And so on the top row of graphs, you'll see each color represents the 23 cell lines of that control um, uh, experiment. And across you'll see the 10 different probes. And so you can see that they all sort of hover in this, around in the same count for most of it. The left two are tumor-specific markers, and you can see some specificity where um, the, F the cancer samples, um, epithelial samples, um, are high in those. The next four are sort of um, immune markers, and you can see some cell lines that are derived from um, immune cell types such as DERCAT um, are high in these different markers, CD3, um, CTP, RC, for example. One thing to note um, is that because of this uh, tiling of these 10 different probes and is shown on the bottom, is that it does lead to the potential of detecting splice variants. And we're just showing two examples here from this experiment, P10 and P27. But on the left in the P10, you can see that in the cell line CCRF, um, the 10 probes that map to exon 4 um, have a low count compared to its, its neighbors. And lastly, I wanted to go through um, some of the validation with the IHD uh, visualization markers. So on the left, there's a tonsil tissue that is uh, stained with DNA, CD3, a T cell marker, and PAN-CK. And you can see the mor different morphologies of this tonsil tissue. Um, the green highlights the epithelial cells, 
um, and the pink highlights the T cells. In this experiment, we gridded the ROIs of 300 microns in height and length, and we've shown sort of this um, expression profile of the keratins within our um, within our panel that matches sort of the morphology of the tissue as well as the CD3 expression. And so this is a nice spatial molecular fingerprint of the tonsil. So some concluding thoughts uh, is that we've um, demonstrated with these development panels that we can do in situ RNA expression profiling in FFP tissues with 5,000 in situ hybridization probes that represent about 1,500 genes involved in amino oncology pathways. That GSB NGS readout was uh, determined to be accurate and robust based on the reproducibility, cross platform concordance, and validation of the digital count. Additionally, the scalability and high throughput of NGS readout enables the flexibility of genomics. GSB experimental design. This includes sampling a few regions per tissue or possibly unbiased coverage across a tissue, such as the grid. And lastly, um, I highlighted the feature of geomics GSB with NGS readout measures the mRNA abundance uh, with up to 10 independent probes tied along the transcript and enables the ability for in situ detection of spike variants. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Maya, who will be talking about um, a project that we've been collaborating with her on. Thank you, Margaret. So we will move on to our next presentation. So my name is Maya Kiru. I'm an assistant professor of uh, dermatology and pathology at University of California, Davis. And our project that I will be talking about today is identification of cell type specific RNA biomarker candidates in melanocytic tumors using the digital spatial profiling that Margaret talked about. So firstly, I would like to acknowledge everyone that took part in this. So uh, from UC Davis, um, Dr. John McPherson and um, the scientists at NanoString, um, Margaret, um, Michelle Kreiner, and Joseph Beecham. And um, myself, I have no co financial conflicts of interest. So the hypothesis for this study is that the key genes that are involved in melanoma genesis serve as objective biomarker candidates and potential therapeutic targets that would ultimately lead to decreased morbidity and mortality from melanoma. To give you some background about melanoma, so it is the most um, dangerous type of the common forms of skin cancer. And early diagnosis is critical to improving outcomes. The diagram I'm showing here shows uh, survival rate over time stratified based on the primary tumor stage. And primary tumor stage of melanoma is determined mainly by the thickness of the tumor. So if we look at this um, graph, the T1 um, a and T1B stage tumors, those are tumors that are only under one millimeter in thickness. And the survival rates are very good, usually um, around 90 or over 90 percent. However, when we go down to the uh, T4B tumors, these are tumors that are over four millimeters in thickness and ulcerated, the survival rates drop down under 50 percent. So it's critical to diagnose melanoma early. However, sometimes an accurate diagnosis is challenging. And the main reason is that benign melanocytic tumors called nevi or moles can act as mimics of melanoma. And this can result in diagnostic disagreement between pathologists 
who usually make the diagnosis of melanoma in up to 10 to 25% of cases, which is quite high. Therefore, there are an increasing interest in the last few years to develop molecular tests to improve the diagnostic accuracy of melanocytic tumors, as well as tests to more accurately define prognosis of these uh, patients, and also for advanced melanomas to determine who are the best candidates for certain therapies, like targeted or immunotherapies. So if we look at the diagnostic tests that are currently available, um, these include comparative genomic hybridization and fluorescence in situ hybridization. Additionally, there is a newer test that is available that looks at gene expression of uh, melanoma tumors. And another test that is worth mentioning is a prognostic test that also looks at gene expression um, of formal infected paraffin embedded tumors. The problem, however, with these tests is that they um, might not be technically adequate for tumors that are in the indeterminate stage, that are characterized by low cellularity and low purity that would pose challenges to the technologies these currently available tests are using. Therefore, we wanted to look at spatially resolved analysis that might enable identification of novel biomarker candidates that could then potentially be used for, for diagnostic and prognostic purposes. So the slide here I'm showing um, shows a melanoma. Up at the top is the epidermis, which is the top layer of the skin. And down below is the second layer of the skin, which is called the dermis. And the circles here are showing regions of interest and the heterogeneity within this tumor. If we start from the top, the top circle shows melanoma in situ. So that is melanoma that's growing within the epidermis, but it's not invasive. Then if we go all the way down to the bottom on the right side, that circle shows invasive melanoma, and these melanocytes are malignant invading into the dermis. On the left side, in the middle of the slide roughly, is another region of interest that shows inflammatory cell infiltrates that are very typical in, especially in malignant melanocytic tumors. And then on the lower left side is another region of interest that shows melanocytes that look different from the invasive melanoma cells. These melanocytes are smaller and may represent a precursor nevus associated with this tumor. So in this study, we wanted to use um, an RNA assay with next generation sequencing readout on formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues derived from patients. And this is the GeoMX digital spatial profiler, profiler that Mar Margaret talked about. And I will just very briefly go over the steps, but I want to highlight the main thing um, here, which is that we can use formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. And, um, and that is um, um, one of the key things um, of this experiment. So firstly, we take a tissue, tissue section and um, hybridize that with the probes that we're using. And then we image the slide and select the regions of interest. And we will go over that um, in the next slides. And then, as Margaret described, uh, we will use UV cleavage to cleave off the oligos of the probes, and then aspirate these into a microcapillary and dispense them onto a um, 96 well plate. And this is then followed by um, next generation sequencing to establish uh, counts for these probes. And 
Margaret went into more details of the process, but basically the first step is the NGS library prep, and there are the unique identifiers. One of the that uh, identifies the probe and, an, and another unique molecular identifier that enables um, digital counting of the reads. And then we this is followed by sequencing, bioinformatics, and statistical um, um, analyses to then establish gene counts. So in the first phase of our study, we wanted to evaluate the technical performance and reproducibility of this technology in melanocytic tumors. And we used four tumor types that span the spectrum of melanocytic tumors from benign to malignant. And these included common nevus, dysplastic nevus, melanoma in situ, and melanoma. We had one case for each tumor type. The pilot RNA panel included over a thousand probes for over a hundred genes. And we used digital spatial profiler replicates. So these are serial sections of the same tumor tissue with the ROIs aligned. And we also used sequencing replicates, which are duplicate PCR and sequencing from the same DSB tag collection. So firstly, I will show you the selection of ROIs. So the H&E image up at the top shows one of the tumors that we analyzed. And the circles depicted there are the ROIs we selected. So for example, ROI 17, shown on the lower left side, has a uh, region that is uh, enriched for immune cells. And the immunofluorescence image on the right side shows red fluorescence, which is for CD3, which is a T cell marker. For ROI13 um, on the right side, we have a region of interest that shows melanoma cells within the superficial dermis. And on the immunofluorescent image on the right side, this uh, shows green fluorescence and um, where we used two melanocytic markers. We classified the ROI types based on the cell types. We classified them into immune-rich, into melanocyte-rich, into um, keratinocyte and melanocyte-rich areas. And these typically were um, areas that included epidermis, where the melanocytic tumor was growing. And we also had areas that were mixed that, that included mel melanocytes, immune cells, and sometimes keratinocytes. And lastly, we had regions that included control epidermis only. So firstly, I want to show you the sequence steps across these different ROIs. So we had a total of 25 million reads. And on the x-axis are all the different ROIs. And on the y-axis are the read counts. So firstly, the two stars that you see there are the negative controls. So we expect few reads there, as is shown um, on the diagram. Secondly. There are black boxes um, on some of the ROIs, and these were areas that were under sequence samples, and these were excluded. And in, in total, um, sequencing was successful for at least one of the PCR replicates for most of the ROIs, so 95 out of 96 ROIs. Secondly, I want to show you how well the digital spatial profiler replicates and the PCR replicates correlated. So the top diagram there shows the DSP duplicates. So these were the serial tissue sections that were analyzed, showing very uh, reproducible results. 
And then the lower diagram shows the PCR duplicates, again, correlating very well. Next, I want to show you how the melanocyte-associated gene counts correlate with the immunofluorescence staining with melanocyte markers. So here on the left side are the ROIs we analyzed from one tumor. And the ones that are highlighted with the green outline are the ones that are showing uh, melanocytes within the ROI, as shown with the green fluorescence. And then if we look on the right side, we see the gene counts, and we see higher peaks, higher gene counts for those ROIs. So for example, if we take ROI 13, which has green fluorescence and is a melanocyte-rich area, and look at the peak on the right side, and we see um, um, high gene counts there from melanocytic markers. And then we compare it to ROI 17, which is an ROI that is immune-rich, and look at the gene counts on the right side, we see that the gene counts are low for that ROI as it is an immune-rich area. On the next slide, we're doing the same thing, but for immune gene counts now. So the ROIs that have immune-rich areas are highlighted with the, the red um, outlined boxes. And then again, on the right side is the diagram showing gene counts. If we look at the same ROI, so ROI 17, which is an immune-rich area, and we look at the gene counts on the right, we see that there are high gene counts for immune cells. And then if we look at ROI 13, which was a melanocyte-rich area, and look at the um, gene counts on the right side, we see that the gene counts are low for the melanocyte-rich ROI. So, these first phase established the technical reproducibility um, of the technology. And then in the next phase, we wanted to look at um, gene expression across tumor types and across cell types to identify novel biomarkers. And we used the same for tumor types, common nevi, dysplastic nevi, melanoma in situ, and melanoma. And in this experiment, we had three cases per tumor type with a total of 12 tumors. And we used an expanded RNA panel that included uh, roughly 5,000 probes for over 1,400 genes. This table shows the sample characteristics for phase two. So all of these individuals were between ages 50 to 70, including both females and males. And the melanomas um, at the bottom rows there were stages either 1A or 2B. This result shows ROI clustering by cell type and by tumor type. And it shows how nicely um, the, these um, ROIs cluster. So if we look at the um, top bar, it shows clustering by ROI type. So on the left, the left-sided cluster is the immune-rich area. In the center is the melanocyte-rich area. On the uh, next to that is an area with the um, keratinocytes and melanocyte-rich um, areas. And then on the right side, we have another immune-rich area. And then the bars below show clustering within each cell type uh, by tumor type. So if we look at the immune-rich area on the left side, we see that the melan melanomas cluster on the left of that, and then the, ne the nevi on the right of that. And if we look at the melanocyte-rich area, um, melanocyte-rich ROIs in the center, we see the same thing, melanomas cluster on the left and then uh, nevi on the right side. So this, um, this clustering suggests that these, each tumor type, they may have a distinct molecular signature. 
So our next question was, what is driving um, the ROI clustering? What genes are driving it? And we firstly wanted to validate this using some of the known melanoma genesis associated genes. And then look at differential expression analysis, especially between nevi and invasive melanomas. And then comparing ROI types separately. So one of the um, known melanoma genesis genes that we looked at is called PRAIM. It stands for preferentially expressed antigen in melanoma. And this gene is already used in the available clinical diagnostic assays. There are two tests available. One is a um, adhesive patch RNA expression assay that looks at the expression of two genes, one of which is PRAIM. And in this test, uh, basically a sticker is put on the lesion on the skin, and RNA is extracted uh, from that, mainly um, RNA from the stratum corneum or the top of the skin. And, um, and then expression of the genes is looked at, and PRAIM is one of them. Then there is another essay that looks at expression of roughly 23 genes, um, of which PRAIM is one of, and um, this is used for uh, diagnosis of melanomas from FFP material. Now, these diagrams show um, expression of PRAIM um, in different ROI types, so we'll focus on the melanocytes on the left side. And the diagram shows a comparison between nevi and melanoma. So on the x-axis is full change relative to nevi, and on the y-axis is significance. So in melanomas, PRAIM um, shows two full change relative to nevi, uh, validating the, um, the uh, assay further. And then on the next slide here, we looked at the immune microenvironment and looked at antigen presentation genes um, and the um, expression differences between melanomas and nevi. And now uh, we'll focus on the immune-rich ROIs on the right side. And again, the same thing, where x-axis is full change in melanoma relative to nevi and y-axis is, is significant. So there are numerous immune-rich, um, numer numerous immune-associated um, genes that are um, elevated uh, in terms of expression in melanomas compared to nevi. So with that, I would like to summarize the study. So firstly, we learned that early diagnosis of melanoma is critical to improved survival. The problem, however, is that a subset of melanomas are difficult to diagnose accurately. Therefore, there's growing interest in novel molecular technologies. However, the current tests that are available um, do not necessarily work well for tumors that have low cellularity and purity. And these types of tumors pose challenges to these current technologies. Therefore, we looked at spatially resolved analyses that might enable identification of novel biomarkers for improved, prognos uh, pro uh, improved diagnosis as well as improved prognostic stratification of patients. And in this study, we showed the technical reproducibility of the assay as well as we showed some data on uh, the performance of the study in terms of identifi and identifying novel uh, biomarkers in melanocytic tumors. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.